Welcome to Ideas of India, where we examine the academic ideas that can propel India forward. My name is Shruti Rajagopalan, and I'm a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Today, my guest is Rohini Nilekani, who's a journalist, children's book author, activist, and philanthropist. Rohini is the founder of Arghyam, a foundation for sustainable water and sanitation, and the co-founder of Pratham Books. She is the chairperson of Rohini Nilakani Philanthropies and the co-founder and director of Ekstep, a non-profit education platform. Rohini and her husband Nandan Nilakani have pledged to give half their wealth to philanthropic endeavors as part of the giving pledge. We spoke about her latest book, Samaj Sarkar Bazaar, A Citizen-First Approach, the role of civil society in filling the gaps of a dysfunctional state, physical versus digital public infrastructure, how government regulation on foreign contributions impacts philanthropy and civil society, the role of citizens, and the imbalance between state, society, and market relationships in India. For a full transcript of this conversation, including helpful links of all the references mentioned, click the link in the show notes or visit discoursemagazine.com. Hi, Rohini. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to talk to you about the book, Samaj Sarkar Bazaar. These are three themes that I am very interested in, though I mostly work in the bazaar markets part of it as, you know, an economist in my day job. But yes, it's a great book and a pleasure to have you here. Shruti, thank you so much for inviting me to your Ideas of India podcast. It's an honor and I'm looking forward to our conversation. So, you know, I want to start with the sort of theme and the title of the book. It is Samaj Sarkar Bazaar. And it is not a coincidence that you start with Samaj because uh, so much of your work is about that. But when I read the book, my sense was that you've had this long-held feeling that sort of the Sarkar and the Bazaar are very, very large in India, right? So it started with the Sarkar being very large, starting with the colonial state and so on. And and of course, the big, you know, central planning machinery that India imposed. And post-liberalization, the Bazaar has sort of taken off. And there are great benefits from it, but, you know, also a lot of exit by rich people, you know, from public service delivery and so on, which is sort of officiated through the Bazaar. And what has ended up happening happening in India is that the Samaj has ended up becoming the last of the three. And you've sort of put it right up front. So can you tell us more about where this thought process came from? Yeah, thank you, Shruti. I would say that the book is Samaj Sarkar Bazaar, a citizen first approach, because the idea of the book was to sort of describe the philosophy underlying my work and how I came to it. For those who Don't know these three words. Samaj is society, Sarkar is the state, and Bazaar is the market. So society, state, and markets are the three sectors that many, 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 many people for hundreds of years have been thinking through and writing about. So that's not new, but I did want to say to people and readers that I have come to believe that somewhere by not putting Samaj and society right at the foundation, at the base, at the center, if you will. Perhaps we have allowed ourselves to forget that the state and the market, the Sarkar and the Bazaar, were actually created for the Samaj. And so I wanted to keep on repeating this idea that we should not forget that Samaj, society comes first. And it's not the third sector. Civil society is called the third sector. But society can't be the third sector. It is the primary sector. And so therefore, while we very much need the state and the markets, we cannot do without. What is the proper balance of accountability so that the state and the market are actually serving the larger public interest? How should society organize itself so that the market and the state are more accountable to it? That is my underlying permanent question in the quest for a good society. So do you think this has happened in India partly, you know, Samaj ends up being the third wing, right? Some call it the third pillar. Do you think this has happened because it's so much easier to define where Sarkar and Bazaar 
begin and where they end and it's very difficult to do that with society right because that itself is so fractionalized and the same participant can be part of multiple different you know areas in society or multiple different civil associations and that all gets jumbled into one big thing like a big monolith so do you think one aspect of this is just a definitional problem and that's why it gets left behind it's possible because society seems too broad a vessel to hold whereas you know you can see and meet elements of the state there are rules and laws written around the state we know what the bazaar or the markets are supposed to do it's much harder to pin down the idea of samaj because everything and everyone is samaj right so having said that which is precisely why i'm interested in flipping that mental model how do we allow ourselves to understand samaj and i think for me one of the ways to do that is through defining ourselves as first human beings and then citizens i think the practice of citizenship allows you to define yourself as a member of the samaj especially in modern nation states so maybe that's one way but in india i think we have a 5000 year unbroken history of the samaj right and in earlier formations the state was mainly monarchical rulers and even though they ruled and some ruled well and some ruled pretty despotically the samaj itself was fairly intact in its many many dimensions in its many groupings and subgroupings and the rulers the kings and their you know their various satraps while they played a role they didn't cover all of society society did many things on its own that were beyond the pale of the monarchs so in that sense i think samaj has been pretty strong in india for millennia no absolutely it doesn't necessarily always mean good and certainly doesn't mean homogeneous or monolithic i have said that samaj is more like a patchwork quilt and sometimes it's very hard to bring samaj together for one cause we have seen it episodically in history like during the freedom movement perhaps of india but otherwise it's not so easy to get all of samaj aligned which is why perhaps it's easier to define the state and the markets and for me i mean while i was reading the book it also seemed like more than just society what you are very focused on is civil association and the ability to join groups that one is not necessarily born into yes. that also takes us a step away from a lot of the problems of you know many millennia old indian samaj which doesn't change quite easily and has stayed still this is also something the constitutional framers struggled with because they wanted to in a sense create you know madhav khosla says it's a pedagogical project to actually you know bring society out of that millennia old thinking and a lot of the statutes you you know early in the republic were about you know whether it's abolishing untouchability or you know anti discrimination laws these were all about that break from samaj so in a sense even within samaj you are really talking about an individual's right to civil association yeah but more than a break from samaj certainly whether it was ambedkar or gandhi or so many others right gopal krishna gokhale going even further back certainly there was a great attempt to reform parts of the indian samaj and to make it more modern leave behind some practices that no longer especially when it came to caste but yes i think what i am possibly referring to as samaj in this century is our ability to secure our agency as citizens and before that i care very much about the human project but we leave that aside for now to secure our agency as citizens for collective action to make claim making on the state or to make sure the market is doing right by us as consumers so yes i would talk about our ability to form associations and institutions and to throw out societal leaders that enable this continuous development of what used to be called civic virtue or citizenship really and this in sense comes from some of your early work as a citizen activist right you've been a very important voice especially within bangalore advocating for public service delivery especially the most basic things like you know road safety clean water law and order you know that kind of very local government you know this is almost like what a functional municipality should be doing which i know in bangalore is not so functional so unlike say the gandhian project or you know what happened during the anti emergency agitations or something you know during the chipko movement your project 
in the last few decades has been very much about filling the gaps that has been left by a dysfunctional state especially dysfunctional local governments so do you feel like some of the you know the core things that you're doing though we always need to think citizen first would they even be essential if we had well functioning local governments you know in a sensible situation you would be the perfect person to run for local government you know sort of like a mayor for a city or something like people who kind of do the work that you do lend the voice that you lend but in india it ends up going into samaj because that's filling the gap for the dysfunctional local government But I guess that's where I slightly want to clarify my position. One is, by the way, I don't want to make any claims whatsoever about my role in Bangalore. Bangalore is full of urban reformers. I, in fact, have stayed at the background and been able to support some reform projects rather than be at the forefront myself. So let me clarify that first. Secondly, I think while I agree with you that. and i've been thinking about this a lot recently like in many western countries where public infrastructure is very well developed there is no need for citizens to keep agitating for water electricity and so transport mobility etc so while that is true that much of our claim making on the state is just say how can you improve your governance to deliver the basic services that we need and expect from you having said that it's not only about public service delivery because i keep feeling and listening and watching that the western countries have reached for 300 years there has been definite civil society movement to get this kind of governance happening it didn't just land on their heads as a manna from heaven we don't just get good governance as some kind of right we have to earn it we have to co-create good governance in democracies especially so i think that journey in the west is maybe hidden now because it's all seems to be like a done project and we are still in that transition here in india but even if the government was performing its public service duties perfectly i think there would still be a great need for citizens to be involved in the governance model because i still believe that citizens need to be able to imagine their habitats their cities and the project of what their nation should be like so you can't just leave things to government is what i believe which is why i come back to the idea of samaj all the time so i live in northern virginia and here there is something called the park services right i mean mm-hmm. they, it's there at the federal level it's there at the local government level and when a particular park was going to be converted you know into a slightly more polished space with you know lots of turf and you know put in swings and slides for kids and a separate area for dogs and things like that there was quite a bit of drama in my community and the reason was that you know this is going to be a 5 million dollar project is this really necessary can't kids just play on the grass is this the best use of taxpayer money and so on and i've seen the same kind of very passionate advocacy when i go back to india i'm i'm not from bangalore but you know i grew up in new delhi my parents live in noida when i go to their sort of you know condo building association or a residents welfare association it's the same thing it's just very passionate advocacy so is one part of the problem not that citizens are not involved but that we have a fundamental design issue the way we've created the local government structure doesn't allow for deep participation either as citizens or as citizen elected representatives or as taxpayers especially when it comes to urban local bodies and the 74th amendment because it doesn't have you know gram sabha and and those sorts of spaces Yeah no it's the 74th amendment is really an incomplete project and we have seen it in Bangalore with so many people pushing so hard for much more decentralization it's happening only in bits and pieces i think it's fair to say that there is no real state backing and it's not surprising at all for the decentralization of power because especially for large cities like Bangalore some 40 50% of the state's gdp comes from here state government doesn't want to lose control the citizens have been fighting for decades now and are able to snatch some things but not along the lines envisaged in the 74th amendment with ward sabhas local elections the mayor had would become possibly there would be a metropolitan council none of those things have happened in bangalore and have happened in very few other cities of india so this remains an incomplete project but it needs to happen it needs to happen because otherwise like we saw in china cities can become very powerful engines and i hope in india of inclusive growth 
they can become for but for that i think state governments are going to have to let go of some power or at least some negotiations must happen so that urban local governments become stronger most definitely so the other link we've broken in india and this is again a design issue is that our citizens and taxpayers are not the same person you know in most places in local government there's a very tight feedback loop between the government and the participant you know citizenry because the same people who are paying for government are also the people who are voting and here the government gets its money you know in a very top down way some of it is union government grants directly coming you know it's almost like you know there's this bizarre splitting of the pie and the rich places get left behind the most and on the other hand you have a very strong participatory democracy which has been created by the 73rd and 74th amendment so i'm thrilled that people are participating but that link is broken and we we see it most in places like bangalore which are very rich which have people who can pay citizens who are willing to pay for these services but now they're doing it by exiting and doing it through the market instead of doing it through the state Exactly right. I think I'm not an economist, so I won't try to talk in economist terms. But exactly as you say, the link between the taxpayer and the claim on the state as a citizen receiving services is not there. And uh, there are some powers, of course, to the local bodies. Property tax is one of them. But we don't see that coming back to improve the public infrastructure here. And nor can we make those demands because we don't know how to structure those demands because we can't see those connections between the taxes that we pay and what is due back to us. There have been a lot of interesting experiments on participatory budgeting, etc., in Bangalore to make citizens more aware of this. But uh, <laughs> it is work in progress, to say at best. and i talk about this a lot that the elite in india have completely seceded and therefore they have private electricity private schools private water private mobility everything almost they also have gated communities now they don't seem to share a common fate and so they are not pressing harder for improving the common public infrastructure but we are going to see that happen because you cannot secede from floods you cannot secede from pandemics and you cannot secede from pollution air pollution especially and so i think the elite are going to have to wake up a little and push and participate in creating better common public infrastructure and public goods Yeah absolutely so you know my colleague Alex Tabarrok he and I wrote this paper on Gurgaon and we called it India's private city and what we meant is Gurgaon just grew so fast that between the two three census it never got labeled correctly as an urban area deserving its own municipality because by the time it happened Gurgaon had just exploded in its growth so all the gaps were filled by private players and that's great in one sense because the public needs are being met but on the other hand you create all sorts of commons problems right outside the private boundary so the moment the private building or you know the dlf private enclave ends you see piles and piles of garbage right you see groundwater depletion so all those things they need to be navigated through some other form of collective action Yeah, is that even happen in a private city built by the Tatas like Jamshedpur? Yes, it was absolutely phenomenal inside and outside. It was the other kind of India. But it's interesting, you know. I grew up in Mumbai, Shruti, and I was just thinking that when we grew up, actually, in, I grew up in the sixties and seventies in Mumbai, and actually we had, I mean, relatively good public infrastructure. Nobody had power cuts. I mean, I'm not talking about the very poor in the slums, but the lower and middle classes and the rich there's not that much difference in terms of consumption of public services we had very good mobility we had public safety we had street lighting we had electricity and we had good water in the taps it started deteriorating later and there were some private agencies providing those services too but even with though we lived in apartment buildings those apartment buildings were not so gated the there was the boundaries were very blurred the sandwich wall outside even people begging for arms they were right there they were not hidden they could see us we could see them there was some kind of conversation and communication among classes that is becoming much less in this modern idea of india 
Yeah. And you know, this particularly bothers me in Delhi, especially the resident welfare associations. I'm very happy they exist and they advocate for, you know, their own communities. But it's become a very strange kind of nimbyism. I don't know if you've been to the posh colonies in Delhi recently. They have all these gates. They literally have gates with guards. And the local park is locked out. Why? Because they don't want the children of the maids playing there. You know, it's it's supposed to be meant for city beautification and greenery. But it, you know, no public. And these are public roads. where I can't drive my car if I don't have an address on that street. So there is an encroachment of, you know, public spaces by private individuals. But on the other hand, there's also this very strange segregation that has happened where when rich people and the elite do engage, they're not doing it in the most inclusive way. It's taking a very strange form. I find that very disturbing, actually. Yeah. That this kind of fortress... mentality has yeah. come in with the elite of india and i don't think it holds great portents frankly so something has to give and we need much more debate and discourse on this as well and maybe a shift in policies too you know how how do you block off a public road i live in koramangala in bangalore and where we live is not in a very complimentary way called billionaires row because some of us who were living here before became billionaires right and most of us try to be good citizens but obviously there is going to be some sense that you know we make property prices rise you know however much you try to be part of but i'll tell you in this block we still go out there i still participate in things that concern our block there is no gates outside our community there was some talk of that everybody pushed it back third block is open anybody can come from anywhere these are public roads paid by taxpayer money even though okay there are some billionaires living here but anybody can walk past and it's not gated and it's not a fortress and it's not an enclave and i think i much prefer that style of urban habitation we have a park where everybody walks everybody and anybody walks there's a lake coming up which everybody is going to participate in the villagers are going to graze their cattle just next to that so that's the kind of i think vision of urban india which would serve this country better the samaj it has Absolutely. to serve the samaj So you said you grew up in Mumbai and one interesting thing about you know the functional municipal corporations in India is that they were all set up by a colonial government right the post colonial government only focused on the top levels at especially union and then state but never really made it its job to think about local governments they thought the states will do that so is one part of municipal governance just that it takes a very long time to build capacity it takes a century and a half and mumbai was reaping the benefits in the 60s and 70s because it had had a proper design maybe 100 150 years before that and that's just how long these systems take to set up it's entirely possible we forget how young a nation this is and how you know 30 years of liberalization has also brought in the much more public finances in the there's much more in the coffers to even develop the public infra that our cities need so i'm sure of that i mean some cities like bhopal indore surat are showing that actually you can speed up the process but yeah i agree and also the cities are growing like teenagers on hormones right they're going so fast with gangly all over the place it's kind of hard to build that much infrastructure for the rate of the demand that is building up so yeah it will take time and even as infra gets built out we are seeing the demand goes even higher so then we're always lagging behind but bombay went through that spurt and settled down and then found kind of a new equilibrium and i think bangalore my city is in that transition the metro is just getting built out i think in 10 years you will see probably a different bangalore so i agree with you we need a lot of patience but it's really very hard for the citizens in the meanwhile <laughs> I feel like it is difficult for people to come out and agitate about, you know, constitutional design and reform and the architectural aspects if they're spending 2 hours every day in traffic. If they can't trust that their child can go alone using public transport to school and someone has to ferry them and ferry them back. So, I think it also impacts, I mean, there's a limited amount of time and attention any citizen can give to these these causes yeah. and it gets eaten up by this in particular like just navigating public spaces on a daily basis very true which is why though in my philanthropy i'm very happy to support 
a bunch of new organizations with young leaders that are coming up with different forms of civic activism, new forms of it, including digital activism, which takes less time than standing with slogans and pamphlets on the roadside. So they are able to galvanize more people to get interested in hyper-local problem solving and some at a slightly larger level. So that's the kind of emergent new collective action in urban spaces that I'm interested in. Some of them are hyper-local about your local street safety or street lights or something. But some of them are across the board looking at, say, some policies that you should be signing up or you should be giving feedback on policies that have been put out for public consultation, gathering people to understand that and respond. So that kind of new activism is coming up and it's good to see young leadership there. Absolutely. And, you know, here I want to talk a little bit more about Nilekani Philanthropies, which is sort of, you know, the umbrella organization that supports a lot of these other, you know, civil associations, NGOs, think tanks and so on. And I have noticed that there seem to be two distinct sides to Nilekani Philanthropies and a lot of the work that you enable. So one is sort of exactly what you described, a citizen first participatory bottom up approach, which can take lots of different forms, sometimes through local leaders, sometimes through digital activism and so on. And the other side is about a systems architecture or system design approach. And I presume some of this is Nandan's influence because, you know, he's worked so keenly on that. So do you view these two sides as complementary? Do these approaches ever clash or are they feeding into each other? You know, the the citizen participation is giving your overall philanthropic institution a lot of feedback on how you think about systems design or vice versa? Yeah, I hope they're complementary. But my work and Nandan's work, sometimes he does some different work, my husband, and I do different work. And then we do some work together. But we keep learning from each other, I hope. So Rohini Nilakini Philanthropies Foundation, which I finally had to set up because the scale of the work was becoming too large to do it ad hoc works on this very clear philosophy that whichever areas of work we take up, our job is to enable civic associations, the ideas, the institutions, the individuals in the Samaj that are working to improve whatever sector they are working in. And we will support the strengthening of the societal muscle to do that. So whichever sector we work in. So that's very clear in RNPF. Some of the work we have done together at XTEP Foundation, that is more about in education we started. What do we need to do to trigger the ecosystem to improve the learning opportunities for 200 million children in India in a very short period of time? Now, that is a very different way of thinking than how I started my work, though I had some systemic level experience through my work at Argyam in Water, my work on reading and the joy of reading in Pratham books and some other associations earlier. But this was a different way of thinking. So my job at XTEP is to remind us that there is a bottom-up approach that is essential. And my way to learn from the people at XTEP is how do you look at a technology backbone? How do you look at systems architecture to create change which can either be incremental, which is good, but system-wide incremental. And that's important. So like plus one thinking, where even if you're changing one small thing, you're changing it across the full horizontal space. And I think I've learned a lot from working in the last seven years with Nandan. And I think that's feeding back into the work of my grassroots kind of organizations as well, because they too are now thinking, how do we scale our missions? Not necessarily our organizations, but our missions. And for that, then they have to take a very different approach to strategic partnerships and collaboration. So I hope it's all feeding into each other. So I think it's more complementary than contradictory. But of course, sometimes there are tensions. And I don't really mean just personally between the the approaches that two of you share or, you know, the organizations may share. But more philosophically, you just talked about scale. And the lovely thing about creating like, you know, sort of system architecture is that it allows things to scale in a very sensible way and apply things with a sort of universality, 
right? But how does one make sure that universality does not become uniformity? Because so much of your work, which is citizens first participatory approach, is actually really about how diverse the problems are. The problems in Bangalore are not the same problems 50 miles outside Bangalore and are certainly not the problems in Kabini or the problems, you know, in rural areas. So that part, is that tough to navigate? And is there an inherent tension there? Or is that again a question of good design and feedback? I think I believe in the power of intent a lot. And I think in some sense, all the teams that are working on some of these massive projects that we are engaged in, the power of intent is, I think, underpinned by shared values. And therefore, whatever design we are putting out there, conforms to those shared values and they include that we want to ensure that we are distributing the ability to solve and not necessarily pushing one or two solutions down the pipeline, which means it's very important how you design for this. Second thing we are 100% sure together, the teams that are working together is that you want unified solutions for sure, but they cannot be uniform and elements of it can be uniform. Like if there is a system of ID or if there is a way to make payments, that can be the same. But there has to be continuous allowance for people to be able to respond in their own context. So unified, but not uniform in its design to allow for diversity and contextual responses. So we are very clear that these elements have to be part of the design and Whatever technology is being developed to make these happen must also allow for co-creation so that we are always thinking about enhancing agency. And these are not just words. We have great discussions on whether what we are designing is allowing for it or not. And if it is not, then what must change? So in that sense, I think the bottom-up and top-down projects meet in the form that the power of the intent must translate into the grammar of that intent in the design of the system's architecture. Does it frustrate you sometimes that you work, you know, oftentimes in the space of physical infrastructure, whether it's, you know, trying to get clean water to reach the first mile or, you know, road safety and so on. And Nandan's work on the digital infrastructure he managed to build out the digital infrastructure platform for the entire country faster than it takes most people to agitate and figure out how to build a road. So is this frustrating for you in terms of this huge gap between physical and digital infrastructure? Or is this again a question of just, you know, India has always had this problem. It's leapfrog, right? It gets left behind. So, you know, India had virtually very, very few fixed line telephones. And even after liberalization, telecom liberalization, we saw that, you know, phones went up a little bit. But fixed line telephones never really took off like the rest of the world. We just jumped straight to cellular phones and smartphone technology. And we have fantastic penetration there. So this leapfrogging problem, do you view it as a frustration like, why can't we do it in the physical infrastructure space? Or is this also an opportunity to improve the physical infrastructure? Like, how do you view this? Now, I've really begun to understand Nandan's work. I've been watching now since 2009, right? And we've had some healthy debates along the way. Because for the state, of course, it is easy to roll out a very large scale public infra. And of course, the digital ID project was done very, very quickly, I must say. I think that we are lucky to be able to leapfrog certain, otherwise legacies, you know, if you are stuck in a legacy framework, which are not, it's much harder to change those. So where it's much easier for us to have done this, I believe India has some of the most sophisticated public digital infra in the world. And especially for a country like us, it was built out quite rapidly. I have learned in this last decade, and a little more, that perhaps this leapfrogging and this amazing social adoption of the digital technology where everybody has become savvy about using digital services to enhance, to sort of find a rung on this ladder of, you know, aspiration. It's been amazing to watch. And I have been wondering one question that is interesting me of late. Could this perhaps form the foundations of a different kind of economic democracy. And this economic democracy, which is not like how China did its economic miracle, but quite different, which allows 
horizontal relationship, economic relationships to be formed between small entities. Is the local grocer and the supplier very different from the large scale? So I'm wondering whether this might unleash a different kind of economic democracy, where the 300 or so million people still waiting to climb faster up that ladder may get new chances that we can't imagine yet through access to credit, to all kinds of things. And what would that do even to the development of the unfinished agenda of social and political democracy? I think this will play out over the next few years. And I think it's going to be fascinating to watch. I completely agree with you on how the digital public infrastructure can actually democratize. You know, we talked about civil association. It basically democratizes economic association, right? You can have peer-to-peer transactions. You can directly transact with your vegetable vendor and your auto rickshaw driver without necessarily having a state or a bank intermediary having to go through the transaction. And the fantastic thing about the digital public's infrastructure, again, wearing my economist hat, you know, we would say it dramatically reduces transactions costs, right? Which is the main thing. But for me, the even more interesting thing is so far, I believe for India's set of UPI payments, you know, I'm just talking about UPI within the India stack, about 6.5 to 7% of the people account for about 45% of the spend, right now, which is very consistent with the rest of India. You know, in India, about the top 12 to 15 percent spend about 45 percent of all the consumption expenditure. So some people say, oh, it's again a project for the elite and those who have e-wallets and so on. Do you think about democratization as everyone needs to participate or the way I think about it, which is reduce barriers to entry and eventually people will participate. So for me, democratizing the payment system is more about reducing barriers to access. One day they will come if you build. Yeah, I 100% think so. That it can't all happen at once. 700 million smartphones and almost every 80% of the people have at least shared access. Yes. If not their own private phones, right? That is huge democratization. And we don't even know what that means to people. I think it really means a lot. So while I think we have to watch out, of course, the elite will have capture of any infra that is built out. Obviously, the elite will get it first. But just think how quickly, how rapidly access has gone to the bottom of... I always imagine India, thanks to one of my mentors, not as a pyramid, but as a diamond, like a fat diamond. There is a top elite narrow at the top of this diamond and some very struggling people at the bottom tip of this diamond. And the bottom tip is trying to move up into the fat middle. I think this is allowing that to happen. It's not quite reached the bottom of this diamond, but it's reached pretty close there through this kind of access to public services through mobile telephony. And now we are going to see a lot more happening in transport and mobility with electric scooter. All the prices are going to go down. You're going to see a lot of things. I shouldn't try to sound too much like my husband. We should get back to the Samaj side of this yeah. conversation. No, this is so, mostly a pitch. You know, so the Samaj side of the conversation. So for instance, one thing I'm quite excited about on the India stack is open credit enablement network. And when Yeah. And so this side of the India stack basically to me is very much also in line with Samaj because once upon a time, the government ostensibly decided to own banks because they wanted to reach the first mile. They wanted rural penetration and and so on. And this, in one sense, dramatically reduces the barriers to entry for someone to get credit just based on their past record of payments or past record of service delivery and so on without posting any collateral, right? This is literally a report card of a person's ability, you know, to have less risky capital. So, These are the sorts of things I'm particularly optimistic about because we don't think of credit as part of Samaj, but, you know, credit enables Samaj to participate on a much more long-term and intertemporal basis. So in some senses, these things are deeply entwined. It's very hard to say one thing is only market or one thing is only society. It just, it's becoming much more complex and the digital public's infrastructure space reduces the transactions cost of that complexity. Maybe I'm being too evangelistic, I don't know. (laughs) Oh, I think you're right. Also, credit usually came through circles of trust, right? And yes, those no so much intermediated by caste and community. Now, if you can go beyond that, and then you can create a much more 
inclusive, equitable and widespread. You can increase that circle of trust through policies, laws and enabling infra include. So obviously that is much more desirable than what used to be. And many people believe that this access to timely credit might help pull a lot of people out of, they may be stuck in a little bit of low equilibrium. Yes. And we pull them out of the low equilibrium. Yeah. And you know, especially things like education loans, right? It's very difficult for poor people to post collateral. SBI, until very recently, I think they still do ask for huge amounts of collateral to be posted for education loans, which means only rich property owning class can actually afford it. And with education, the advantage is you can literally get a report card. You know, we can actually value the human capital and the potential sort of like Ambedkar, you know, and say, this is an incredibly smart student, but obviously cannot post any collateral. So maybe again, I'm I'm just an optimistic person. So these sorts of things make me very optimistic about democratizing, whether it's through cell phones. I wonder how Ambedkar would think of it. His own college fees at Elphinstone College, which I also went to in Mumbai, were actually apparently paid by a progressive Maharaja from yes, Baroda. Baroda. As was his Columbia education, actually. Yes. So hopefully you don't need philanthropy except a small amount, maybe a little bit on the edges to allow everybody to get a decent education. No, absolutely. You create the systems that allow everybody to get an education without needing necessarily the philanthropy or the kindness of the rich. Yeah. So, you know, here I want to come back to you and sort of your background and your work. So I feel like there are sort of three aspects to your career. You've been a journalist and a writer for a very long time. This is a side of your life which you've never really halted or stopped, you know, even though you may not work formally for a news publication. You have a side as an activist, you know, this goes back about 30 years, literally on the ground agitation for road safety and things like that. But, you know, more broadly through your direct or sort of background support for some of these organizations. And the third is as a philanthropist, which is much more recent after, you know, sort of Infosys took off and the family decided to set up this foundation. Now, when I think about these three sides, you know, when I think about a journalist, you think about neutrality, someone who's just looking at the facts and reporting them in a fairly impartial way or, you know, chronicling stories. When I think of an activist, I think of someone who is actively disrupting, you know, there's a, there's a disruptive aspect, not a destructive necessarily, but a disruptive aspect. And when I think about philanthropists, I think about people who are builders, sort of, you know, long term thinking and building organizations. Do these different sides ever come into conflict? Like, you know, your ability to be neutral, your ability to disrupt and your ability to build very long term institutions that will outlast many generations? Well, sometimes, but one of the things I learned in my life is to hold contradictions right from my childhood, you know. So I think it's all right. You have to allow contradictions to be held and understand them. So, and luckily these happen in different stages of my life. So I could be a journalist and I realized as a journalist, one learns a lot about Samad, Sarkar and Bazaar. Because when I was in Bombay Magazine or Sunday Magazine, you had to report on everything in Bombay from Bollywood to crime, to political scandals, to everything. So that was Samad, Sarkar and Bazaar. So from there, I learned also about some of the aspects of society that I personally want to be involved in changing. There are many things that agitate us because we can see, we want things to be better. So then I entered the phase of my life where I was no longer uh, being an impartial journalist, but actively working with many other people to say, let's make our roads safer, or let's improve our government schools, or let's improve access to water, or let's put a book in every child's hand. That's where I was in the phase of myself helping to implement certain changes together with hundreds of great people to do that. And then I gently came out of that phase to become a philanthropist where I could support people who were trying to create positive social change. So these were three distinct phases, actually, in some sense, in my life. And the contradictions between them, I don't need to be that neutral anymore, because I'm not writing as a journalist. Now, when I'm writing, I'm writing opinion pieces about what I believe in. And I'm supporting causes that I believe in, which are mainly about democracy, freedom, justice, inclusion, environmental issues, etc. 
Do you ever feel like you have to hold back? I guess that's the day-to-day question, you know, how this conflict or contradiction plays out. Are you in rooms where you're suddenly like, oh, I'm not the activist here, or I'm not the journalist here. The way I ask questions will be different or the way I support this cause will be different. Do you have to actively do that? No, you have to show great amount of restraint as a donor or a philanthropist because the last thing you want is donor-driven agendas. When you're not an implement, if you're implementing yourself, then you do what you want to do. But if you're supporting other people, then you have to trust them and you have to let go of some of the opinions you may have. You have to trust that they know what they're doing in their context. And you have to definitely show a lot of restraint and humility as a philanthropist because you are allowing social change makers to do what they do best and donors don't have all the wisdom they think they have. So yes, definitely You have to hold back a lot, as you say. I may have a certain opinion on, say, privatization of water or whatever that may be. But if I'm supporting an organization that has a different view, in fact, I am known to be a little unconventional in the sense that in all my portfolios, many times I'm supporting organizations that have radically different views from each other. Because I don't think anybody has the answers, frankly. I believe like in nature, you have to create all sorts of experiments. Some will march ahead and prove to be more successful than others. But many different ideas need to be tried seriously and backed and allowed to play out. So in that sense, the ability to hold even those contradictions, I guess, is something that I treasure. No, a portfolio approach is great in everything, right? It's great when you're investing in the stock market. It's great when you're investing in society as a philanthropist. So in India, we have, you know, not a great track record of professionally run philanthropies. And there are many reasons for it. You know, one, most people think of giving in a very charitable sense, like they're doing charity instead of philanthropy. And I can see that in a country like India, where literally outside your doorstep, there are people who are starving, there are people whose kids need to go to school. So it's a very paternalistic sort of let me help. I must so say, and though, so. luckily, not that many people starving now. Yes, of course. In South India, it's really very hard to find very any poverty anymore. Thank goodness. Yes, I think it's salient in my mind because of the pandemic. And you know, again, how people just came out in very large numbers to make sure that nobody's really left behind, everyone is comfortable, whether it was food banks and distribution or helping ensure people's transport back to their village. So in India, most people really think about giving as charitable giving to the end goal that you can see and touch and feel, you know, almost sort of to an individual visibly. level. Yes, very to visibly. visibly alleviate suffering. To visibly exactly. Alleviate. Yes. Yeah. And we don't have too much in terms of very long term thinking of more abstract ideas. So I can think of maybe, you know, the Tatas who set up a very professional sort of philanthropic side or wing to their endeavors. There were a number of old Parsi families in Bombay, you know, going back about 150 years, who tried to build out all these long term infrastructure questions, you know, universities, bridges, so on. But we don't see too much of that. So what is it about the Indian ecosystem, is it a cultural thing that, you know, we are much more in tune with this kind of charitable, visibly reducing suffering kind of state? Is it, you know, maybe because of the Gandhian values or something like that? Or is it just that India didn't have a new class of millionaires and billionaires until 10 years after liberalization. And this also meant that this wasn't like the old business families, you know, the trading families and the business families. After liberalization, India sort of created a new class of people who entered the business sector. They had professionally run firms. In fact, Infosys is famous for being one of the very few large conglomerates where the founders insisted that none of their children will take over the running of Infosys after they stepped down. So is that what is driving Nilekani philanthropies and a lot of the newer philanthropies, especially coming from young tech founders and things like that. So how do you see this space overall? Are we culturally different or just it's a matter of money? We'll get there. I think to be fair, there was a lot of philanthropy earlier, but it was, I mean, the educational institutions and a lot of public infra was set up by business houses, colleges, universities, bridges, parks, many things like that till about the 40s, 50s, 60s. I think in the 70s, after the, say, Bihar famine, you got a lot of new NGOs coming up. 
and philanthropy came in its wake because they set up really important movements, whether it was Mairada in the south for the Bangladeshi refugees that came in post-71 after the Bihar famine. There were things like Pradhan. So there were many very large NGOs that were set up that were funded by both foreign and Indian philanthropy. So it's not like we haven't had examples of all that as well. But it is true that post-liberalization, first generation new wealth, such as we came into, had much more freedom. Others, the industrial families were mostly giving generation to generation and had to continue capital formation within their families and perhaps did not have that much freedom to give it away. But people like us, we are not obligated to pass on our money to the next generation, nor did we receive it from our parents. So we have extreme freedom in how we dispense with it. And I think there's a whole new class of philanthropists who have that kind of freedom. There is also a whole new class of philanthropists who now finally feel so secure in their wealth that they can give away much more with much more risk taking. So you are definitely seeing in the cultural space a lot of innovation. You are seeing in healthcare a lot of innovation. And you are seeing in, of course, education continues to be very big. But you are beginning to see now we are talking about some philanthropy in justice, some philanthropy in media. So there are new areas opening up with new philanthropy in India. And I sincerely hope people are talking about collaborative philanthropy. We are talking about now there is something called the Grow Fund, for example, where we are saying we'll come together to do capacity building of civil society. There are a lot of new trends in Indian philanthropy growing stronger. And I do hope it continues. But, you know, one area where I still find Nilekani philanthropies to be different, perhaps not the only one, but still different is even the business houses and families who manage to actually build out, not just, you know, alleviate pain and suffering, but say build out universities and colleges and bridges and all the examples you gave. It was still very much brick and mortar thinking, you know, something where we can hang a plaque and a name. Whereas one of the things I observe about Nilekani philanthropies is the support for ideas, you know, which is a marked difference. We don't have too many philanthropies outside of maybe the Tata Trust and Nilekani philanthropies which support abstract ideas where one day eventually if the idea grows, it's not going to be a Rohini Nilekani idea. There is no plaque to hang there, right? So is that another cultural difference that, you know, you will have Bits Pilani, which is the Birla Institute of Technology. It's an excellent place. Of course, ideas foster, innovation fosters. But that kind of philanthropy is still very much where you can touch and feel what you gave money to. You can visibly see it as opposed to you are much more comfortable with abstraction. I think a lot more people are doing many more things that are looking at the source of the problem or creating a nationwide sort of, there are people supporting the think tanks of India, new think tanks like Takshashila and IIHS. So many new philanthropists have come, have come forward to support IIHS, for example, which is the Indian Institute for Human Settlements, which is looking at training the next generation of urban professionals and creating better public policy for urban India. So. There are people thinking long term and doing a lot more philanthropy. We are talking to so many people. There is interest. Many of the other Infosys founders like Shibulal are doing things like Shiksha Lokam, which is how do you build the capacity of the leadership of the education system? There are the Piramals are working on the tribal health initiative. So, yes, people are thinking system wide where you can't hang necessarily plaques, Rain Matter Foundation, that is the Zeroda uh, founders, they are looking at issues of climate change, where you certainly can't hang any plaques, but those are the most wicked problems to solve. So people are beginning to come into this space very definitely. But philanthropy can't do it on its own. And I come back to my favorite subject, which is unless you have a thriving civil society that is going to be able to implement some of these things and create all the new civic formations to hold those ideas and to put the public pressure for new public policy formation, the philanthropy by itself may not do it. It's a reciprocal process where civil society comes up with some of the ideation and then philanthropy backs it. So do you feel in one area, you know, where you talked about this two-way street between philanthropy and civil society, one area where the government is kind of cannibalizing this feedback loop 
is by clamping down on funding right so one is there is just a very long list of requirements and oversight that is built into any kind of civil society ngo institution that they need to declare they can be audited in particular foreign funding you know has come under a lot of scrutiny this of course has been going on for now you know not just this government and the previous government but even the one before that but it is now taking on a new shape right and i'm in particular talking about the fcra and the fcra licensing and audit system how does the government sort of regulating or scrutinizing this area impact philanthropists and the civil society movement and that linkage between the two no it's impacting it a lot there have been many more regulations on civil society from what i can understand the government is beginning to feel that we don't need why should we have foreign influence on say policy making institutions and the government clearly feels that we should have more home grown influences and that foreign money should come in only for some things maybe in foreign direct investment into the economic infrastructure or goods and economic goods and services but that when it comes to the non profit side that it should be probably more home grown philanthropy and home grown ideas i think they are kind of coming from that space and that's why clamping down so it is affecting people who were very much used to foreign money coming in for certain kinds of civil society work so the civil society groups have been adjusting i think we will see more not less of that for some time and i think partly it's because a new form of trust needs to build between civil society institutions and the government i think civil society institutions also need to do much better storytelling and much more groundwork to build those relationships of trust so we are definitely in some kind of transition and i think it's a call to action to indian philanthropists and to the indian wealthy that there are many unfinished projects in the country some of them have definitely to do with human rights as well and who better to work on those spaces than indian philanthropists so in that sense i think there is a real opportunity for indian philanthropy to grow here i agree with you but you know there's one side of this where i almost feel like there's sometimes some cognitive dissonance within government institutions where on the one hand it literally criminalizes companies and people working at these companies who don't meet the 2% csr requirement like there's a criminal penalty associated with it right now csr is wonderful and it's done lots of great things especially during the pandemic we saw how useful it is in supporting a lot of the civil society work so on the one hand there seems to be the scarcity driven model oh we have a shortage of money coming into the ngo sector and you know we must literally at the point of a gun force companies to do this and on the other hand it's like oh we don't need the foreign funding so it's in my sense it's like it's got to be one or the other and of course we have to scrutinize questions of money laundering or money going to terrorism or something like that but it just feels very strange I think I understand your interpretation of ideas need to be homegrown as opposed to you know gadgets and widgets can have investment come in from abroad so that might be one point of view but I mean this is what I think is is how go- yeah. I, mean, I don't know this is what I think government is idea is not mine but this is how the state seems to be thinking right now and so therefore their their stopping of foreign money coming in to civil society is an ideological position is it's a political position whereas and the csr regime which was started by the previous government actually at that time i was quite taken aback and wasn't really sure it was going to work it seemed to me like a tax by other yes. by another name exactly and whether business houses were even uh, suited to doing the work of civil society i wasn't very sure some surprising success stories have come out in these 10 years of csr but i think the jury is still out on whether that's the greatest idea whether isn't it better to just tax that 2% or 5% or whatever you want and then strengthen state capacity to deliver so i think the jury is still out on that but surprisingly it's worked out better than i had suspected we were some of the voices speaking out against it when the law came into being some good things have come out but clearly it has also become something that constrains corporations so it is up to them to continue the conversation with the state as to how this can be better implemented and i think the criminal penalty absolutely must go away so the criminal so penalty truthy that this bothers me as a citizen 
that many of our laws are made without necessarily a rational structure of proportionality. And one of the projects we are working with, and we will work closely with government and the justice system, as to do we need to decriminalize some of the provisions of many of our laws? We have some laws which don't make too much sense in terms of how harsh the potential punishment is. If you fly a kite with the wrong manja, it's actually a cope to put you in prison or if you walk your dog wrong or a hundred things which actually criminalize ordinary human failings. And I think there's a lot of work to be done. This government and the previous government have actually taken some of the colonial laws and modernized and updated them. But I think generally there is a lot of work to be done to decriminalize several provisions of Indian law across the board. Yeah. My favorite is tree cutting. When I started law school, my next door neighbor actually called me in and said, we need your advice since you're in law school. Can we cut this tree? Because there are a number of laws, you know, whether it's like, you know, at the highest level, the Forestry Act and local level, you know, both the municipal and the Delhi state and Haryana state and so on. They all have laws that actually carry a six months to two years criminal penalty for cutting a tree without permission. And many of them are non-bailable offences. For the longest time in Karnataka, if you cut a sandalwood tree, you would have to go to jail. And the perverse incentives that come out of these things and the unintended consequences of hastily made laws. I mean, we created Veerappan, who was a a famous sandalwood smuggler. And all the things that happened because of that simply because of poorly flamed laws. So there's a lot of work to be done and there are many good organizations that are in my portfolio that are working with government and with the system to create better laws and to reduce internal contradictions and to set better standards for lawmaking itself. Which takes me to the thing is, there is no demand on our lawmakers at all from the public, right? People don't see necessarily the relationship of their good life and a good law. So there needs to be a much deepened discourse on why good laws make for good societies. I think we don't have enough of that. And also I feel like somehow that colonial mindset of the state-citizen relationship has never quite gone away in the sense that we are not citizens, we are treated as subjects. And I especially see that in the context of foreign contributions because when you see something like the Prime Minister's fund, right, that is allowed to get foreign donations with zero transparency. You can't file an RTI to actually figure out who gave money to the Prime Minister's fund. It's not just the Prime Minister. I'm sure every state government has something like this. It's the same thing for campaign contributions and electoral bonds, right? It's completely anonymous. There is no oversight built into it. It, There's no transparency. It's completely opaque. So it's almost, you know, the the most important thing in a functional democracy where it's a state-citizen relationship is that actually it is the state that is accountable to the citizen. And when you flip it over and make it a state subject relationship, it's the subject who's accountable to the state. So at a very deep cultural level, also, we have we have something to figure out, you know, how to navigate this. How do we go from being subjects to becoming citizens? Maybe that's a longer term project. That's kind of new. Okay, As I said before, independence, the citizen state relationship was very different. It is much later that you come into this idea that people have and that is done through all sorts of sort of handouts and doles that become the norm and the my bap or father mother state emerges especially in the 70s where you expect the state to actually give you doles and a lot of those are arbitrary decisions made not that you claim as a right but are given to you almost as some kind of benefaction from the state and that is what has to change and people are beginning to see the difference between a state that makes universal goods and services, which you can claim as your right. And some of the public digital infra today is making that difference where you can claim as an ordinary citizen your right without necessarily becoming a supplicant or a beneficiary. And I think a new citizen will emerge from that because also we have this generation is much more literate. We have the first fully literate generation in India. The parents of the young ones today are the first literate generation, right? So you're going to see different forms of citizen demand coming. And I think the politicians are very aware and very close to this change. So definitely there is still a very high demand 
on the state to do everything but the conversation in my book at least and in my work i keep making the case that we are citizens first we are not consumers of the market first we are not subjects of the state first and we have to put forward our citizen identity nobody is going to do that for us we have to do it for ourselves the state is much happier to see us as a subject and of course james scott works seeing like a state many people in your podcast refer to that yeah how do we see ourselves as citizens so that the state doesn't see us as subjects there's a lot of work to be done on the samaj that's where i i work and i think that is a continuing work in a democracy how do you develop the societal muscle of citizenship what more needs to be done for people to see themselves as effective citizens who are continuously trying to improve the state of their society and their democracy and that this actually should also give reciprocal joy happiness satisfaction is not only a duty element and we see that in why do so many people join civil society movements organizations ideas institution building because human beings are meant to be social create reciprocities do things that create universal and not necessarily private benefit it is that energy right that drives the larger public good through civic action so we need to focus more on that at least i try to in my work yeah so you know you look from a philanthropist point of view typically the most pressing problems in society are the ones that come to your table right there are lots of claims there are lots of people need money and you have to navigate that choice in some way and often times it's oh my god this thing is completely broken and that thing is completely broken and that needs fixing on the other hand you seem to be a very optimistic person who is always looking forward to changing things who is very happy with incremental change and you know wants to keep pushing forward are you overall optimistic or pessimistic about what's happening in india today and then i'll ask you the same question are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future i think you have to be an optimist i think it's too late for pessimism <laughs> so uh, you have to be optimistic i believe i say that hope is the new religion and hope is i say it's a very positive thing i mean not empty hope but hope that drives you to positive action because there are always going to be things that are going wrong and there is always hope that human compassion empathy the power of human ideas the power of human organization we are always trying to change the world for the better i think optimism of the will especially even if there is some pessimism of the intellect i think optimism of the will is almost required today given that we have very large problems like climate change that we all have to work on so when i think of it as talking to a friend imagine that 8 billion people okay for the first time in human history are together in some way or the other joined in this collective responsibility to heal this planet can you imagine that everybody feels in some way or another part of this grand human mission whether we succeed or not we don't know but we are all going to have to try and who knows what boundless energies and virtues will come out of this manthan this churn towards healing and regenerating this planet so i feel that especially in india with such a young population sometimes i wonder one of the big ideas playing out in the world today is like that schism between the idea of public order and individual freedom i feel like something is getting reset even though technologies are enabling individual expression and freedom there seems to be a kind of a demand in harking back to an almost old eastern idea of public order and these two ideas are playing out in the public spaces and it will be very interesting to see in a young country like india what prevails in this contest between how much can you restrict individual actions and freedoms to create the idea of a certain kind of public order i think that's playing out and i'm very optimistic that young people want their freedoms and want their ability to experiment in their personal lives and in their social spaces and definitely in their livelihoods so i think that grand thing is playing out in india right now with some difficulties as everywhere in the world there seems to be a trend towards authoritarianism in the pursuit of this public order and development model 
so that's playing out in india but you know india is so diverse the headlines it, like they say the map and the territory are different the headlines and what's happening in the country are two completely different things wherever i go when i travel in the field that's when i come back full of hope that people are doing things to change their surroundings for the better they have hope they have optimism they think things in india are going to get better economically socially there is a new sense that india is on the move and sometimes just having that sense makes that come true because you are doing things differently so you see that a lot across the country I completely agree. You know, I live in the United States and when I'm not in India, all I'm consuming is news and Twitter and opinion pages and it can, you know, leave one feeling a, a little bit of despair. But the moment I visit India, it's just optimism all the way because it is so different to be on the ground. And as you said, it's not that the headlines are necessarily untrue, but it is that they are, you know, one part of what's going on in India. And and just sort of the boundless entrepreneurship and energy, especially among young people, India is a very young country. That also makes me very hopeful every time I do visit India. So you know, I'll see you in my next trip to India, and I look forward to that. But thank you so much for doing this. This was such a pleasure, and the book is fantastic, and everybody should read it. And I hope you write more books about you know each of these three aspects, Samad. सरकार एंड बाजार बट स्पेशली मोर ऑन समाज थैंक यू सो मच श्रुति थैंक यू फॉर द कॉन्वर्सेशन आइडियाज ऑफ इंडिया इज प्रोड्यूस्ड बाय द मर्केटिस सेंटर एट जॉर्ज मेसन यूनिवर्सिटी इफ यू एंजॉय दिस पॉडकास्ट प्लीज सब्सक्राइब ऑन एप्पल पॉडकास्ट स्पॉटिफाई और योर फेवरेट पॉडकास्ट एप हेल्प अस ग्रो बाय गिविंग अस अ रेटिंग एंड लीविंग अ रिव्यू फॉलो अस ऑन ट्विटर एट एस राजगोपालन एंड एट आइडियाज ऑफ इंडिया Also check out our initiative commemorating 30 years of India's market reforms at the 1991project.com